Thank you so much for joining us uh, this afternoon for Dr. Alicia Norwood's Virginia Humanities Fellow Talk, Times Too Hard, Single African-American Women in Post-Civil War Virginia, hosted by us here at the Library of Virginia. Please feel free to ask questions throughout the program, either in our chat or question box. We have plenty of events here at the library. My colleague, Elizabeth Lazinski, is going to type in a URL uh, for our events calendar into the chat. And so uh, one of my roles here at the library is I am the liaison for an amazing uh, fellowship program that we have partnered with Virginia Humanities. I want to give them a shout out and acknowledgement. Uh, since 2016, we have hosted um, Public Humanities Fellows here at the library. And the fellows will spend a few months, a semester here at the library doing what I call a deep dive into our manuscript collections. And uh, Dr. Norwood is our most recent fellow, having been here last summer. But I also want to sort of give you a, um, a URL. I think Elizabeth's going to put it into the chat, telling you about the Virginia Humanities Fellowship Program. They have one related to HBCUs and also a K through 12 education fellowship. So you can find out information about those fellowships, including the timelines for how to apply uh, in that uh, in that link. Um, so let me, without further ado, let me introduce our speaker today. Dr. Norwood is currently an assistant professor of history at University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Uh, she received her BA in history from Dillard University, her MA from Texas Southern University, and her PhD from Howard. Her work focuses on 19th century African-American women history with an emphasis on slavery, freedom, and gender. And specifically, her work examines African-American women in the Civil War and post-Civil War, which is, of course, the uh, title of her talk today. Uh, she is working on a manuscript that she has tentatively titled To Never Truck With No Man, Single Black Women During the Civil War and Reconstruction. So I'm going to turn it over to Alicia. So um, my presentation today is um, Times Too Hard, Single African-American Women in Post-Civil War, Virginia. I'm going to do a combo of, I sometimes tell my students that I don't like to read my lecture notes, <laughs> but I do need them sometimes because my mind just goes everywhere. So I'm going to do a combo of reading my lecture notes and um, speaking about how I got involved with this research. In January 1867, freed woman Holly Jennings requested the Freedmen's Bureau help in locating her husband. Her spouse deserted her, and she believed he was living with a woman in a neighboring county. Without support, without his support, she struggled to provide for her five children who ranged in ages from three to 13. Unfortunately, Bureau agents were unable to locate him. In 1868, Jennings agreed to work for Robert Jennings, a planter in Farmville, Virginia. Early on, her employer expressed objections about the size of her family. He warned her if she had another child, she would be dismissed and asked to leave the property. It is not clear if Jennings' husband returned. However, by the summer, she was showing unmistakable signs of being pregnant. In August, 1868, Polly Jennings was accused of murdering her newborn child. Initially, initially, she denied being pregnant, but a thorough investigation by the Freedmen's Bureau official, Peyton Bradshaw, concluded with a first degree murder charge. Bradshaw claimed there was discharge found in her womb and apparent secretion from her breast, proving she had recently given birth to a child. He also interviewed several witnesses who corroborated his evidence. Jane Freeman testified that on, on a Monday between sunset and dark, Polly came to her to borrow a knife. Helda, another resident, recalled another resident on the land, saw Jennings go into the woods and stop near a spring. She vividly recalled the day because she had never seen her down there and thought her behavior was odd. A few days later, Logan, Free Logan a Freedman noticed a large nest of green flies over a stump. He moved the leaves away from the area and unearthed the body of an infant boy. The cause of the death was recorded as an incision made across a jugular vein entirely separating. On December 18th, Jennings was found guilty and sentenced to hang by the neck. 
Her lawyer, Elisha Barksdale, began a, a petition for clemency almost immediately after her charge. Barksdale's campaign was supported by several letters from residents. One such person was Polly Jennings' employer, Robert Jennings, who believed she was guilty, but was ignorant of the heinous crime committed. Moreover, Robert revealed Jennings most likely murdered her child in a desperate attempt to save her other children from home, homelessness and destitution. He plainly stated she slit her newborn's throat out of fear of losing her job. In the same month that Jennings was scheduled to be executed, a judge commuted her sentence to life in prison. While she escaped death, the, the shortened sentence compromised the lives of her children. Only one month later, a Freedmen's Bureau agent who worked in the community wrote his superior, Orlando Brown, inquiring about binding out Jennings' five children to interested planners in the area. Jennings' story reveals the economic and social difficulty single Black women face. Her story is, is not reflective of the way single women responded to their circumstances. However, her experience illustrates the world the women were forced to navigate. The final act of murdering her child reveals her determination to survive in a world where her race, gender, and relationship status worked in tandem to limit her options. While the narrative of women such as Jennings have been incorporated into the broader histories of Black women, my research highlights their existence through the perspective of singlehood. That, um, I start with the Polly Jennings story whenever I start to talk about my research because it was one of the first stories that I found when I started this topic. Um, I came to Howard University um, in 2012 and I was just very interested in um, studying the Civil War. I don't know why. Well, I can't tell you all why. I can share this with you. <laughs> I um, am not a Virginian or a Marylander. I am actually from Texas and I call myself a double Southern girl because I'm from Texas and my parents are from Mississippi. And so I spent time in both states. I um, grew up in Jackson, Mississippi from about K through fifth grade and from fifth grade forward lived in Houston, Texas. And because my parents are from Mississippi, my mom um, was not, I shouldn't say strangely obsessed, but she enjoyed taking her very young children to Civil War battle sites. <laughs> I could not tell you why, and I still ask her this question today, and, uh, but she she always says that it was just something to do outside, even though I think I would much rather have been playing on the playground. I was at the Battle of Vicksburg site, <laughs> and so I was um, a young Black girl at these sites, and Back then, I was not, I did not feel unwelcomed at the site, but I did notice there were no other young Black girls at the sites or very, um, it was very, it was a very rare sighting. And so from an early age, I was just strangely connected to the Civil War. And one thing my mother would always remind me is that although you do not see yourself here, um, and maybe people who don't look like you, this is your history too. Um, and so... I came to Howard in 2012 and I said, well, you know, I'm jumping all the way in. If I'm going to spend a lot of money in student loans <laughs> in several years, I want to study something that I find interesting. And so I started with the Civil War. Um, I said, well, I had, and I'd done some work pre previously in my master's, in my master's thesis about the Civil War, but I, I jumped all in for my PhD. I was honored or um, grateful to study under my dissertation advisor, Dr. Edna Green Medford, who was the foremost Lincoln scholar. And so I got a lot of great Lincoln information. But um, as I was looking through Civil War scholarship, and it, it, I happened to go during a good time, um, I could not, it was not a lot of stuff about Black women and not necessarily about Black women during the war, just I could not find a lot of information in the books that I read. For instance, I, one of the great Civil War books, James McPherson's Battle Cry of Freedom, it just wasn't, I didn't see the history that I actually wanted to, um, to learn in those books. And I love Battle Cry um, for Freedom, but it was just there were no black women in there. And so I started, and, and this is beyond the Harriet Tubman's and the Sojourner Truths. I wanted to know like what is actually happening? Like what, what does it actually look like for black women and their interaction with the Union Army and everything else? And so my 
dissertation advisor encouraged me to, to start looking for Black women. One of the first articles I ever published was about Black women in their letters to Abraham Lincoln. And I was astounded because this is not something that I ever thought about. I never thought about Black women writing Abraham Lincoln, demanding that he, he answer their letters, right? And so I just went all in again and I then discovered the Freedmen's Bureau records. And anybody who starts with the Freedmen's Bureau starts reconstruction research, the Freedmen's Bureau records just pull you in. I mean, you try to turn away your computer at night. And back then it was not a computer. When I started, they had not, they were not on fold three. It was the National Archives. And I would try to not go to the National Archives, but I would go and I'd be stuck on this microfilm machine looking at all of these letters and complaints and just it pulled me in and the first thing that I noticed one of the first things that I found was this um Freedmen's Bureau agent report about the Polly Jennings case and it took my breath away um it not only took my breath away because it's a heinous crime and it's extremely I'm just reading you portions of the testimony but the people who testified the witnesses are so um are so explicit in how they find the baby. And all of the twists and turns, she's she's found guilty. She's her sentence is commuted, all of these things. It was not just this, those things, but it was, wait a minute. Why would Polly Jennings murder her child? Why would Polly Jennings murder her child during a time when in every other textbook or every other um, scholarly book I have read about reconstruction and after the Civil War is this jubilation from Black people. They are excited to be free. They are making new lives and, and getting married and, and opening up schools. So why did life look like this for Polly Jennings? And that took me down the hole. Okay, wait, why did life look like this for Polly Jennings? And what did it look like for other single Black women like Polly Jennings? And, um, that led to seven years of research. <laughs> and so uh, I started I started really wanting to understand. Um, and then as I as I went there, there were there were lots of different ways the research went. And so I found women like Polly Jennings who had been abandoned by um, their partners. I found single women who all in the Freedmen's Bureau records, I found divorced women, I found widowed women. I found all of these different groups of women that I decided to label as single. One of the first sort of introductions to Black women, single Black women in the Freedmen's Bureau, um, I found this, and you can, this, there are lots of, because the Freedmen's Bureau is not just the uh, Polly Jennings cases, and in this, in this case, Maria's case, it is also agents talking about single Black women. And so one of the first, one of the mo most important sources I found was um, an agent, a Freedmen's Bureau agent stationed in Virginia, W.D. Tidball. He talks about, he regularly reported on the conditions of free, free people in his district. His chief concern was a large majority of women who had been abandoned by their husbands. They received a variety of aid from the Bureau, but also used the Bureau's unique post-war court system to disentangle themselves from undesirable or harmful relationships. Single Black women frequently reached out to officers for assistance in 1867, and this is the document you see on your screen. Malia Robertson requested the Bureau support her after caring for her family members for over a year. Robinson contracted consumption. Unable to support her family any longer, she asked the Bureau to take care of them. Other women reached out to the, to the Bureau to help resolve temporary matters. Payne Ellen requested help in acquiring garments after her clothes were taken in jail. The appeals from single Black women with children like Polly Jennings came across the desk of Bureau agents the most. This occurred for several reasons. Single Black, black mothers were largely excluded from the desired post-war work post-war workforce, historian Mary Farmer Kaiser argues that these women faced a difficult labor market. Like Polly Jennings, they were, they had to choose between their children or work or homelessness in some cases because they were no longer valued for their reproduction. As early as 1865, Freedmen's Bureau Commissioner Oliver Otis Howard re realized that the governing of formerly enslaved African Americans who lived among the disgruntled population required close oversight. Although Union soldiers were there and they provided protection, African-Americans still faced a, a prejudiced and discriminatory legal system. 
Black Virginians regularly suffered through unfair sentencing and prejudiced judges who refused to rule in their favor, even when the evidence was favorable. To solve the issue, Howard proposed the creation of a legal system that would help administer justice to, for African-Americans. The court was presided over by a three-person panel, which included a selected representative from the planter class, a representative of the freed people, and a bureau agent. The system ensured all interests would be represented and decisions regarding labor, land ownership, and wages would be issued with compromise. Unfortunately, the court was only given jurisdiction over minor cases, so incidents that violated civil rights were referred to federal courts. As a result, freed people mostly used the court to resolve labor issues and domestic issues. Unfortunately, in many, in, in many instances, the decisions of the court agents remained unenforced. Still, the inefficiency of the court did not hinder Black women from petitioning. In 1867, Maria Wallop, I'm, and I'm also sorry, this is the document you see on your, on your um, screen now. In 1867, Mary Wallop petitioned Germantown, Virginia's court, complaining that her husband had abandoned her. She not only claimed abandonment, but she also stated that all her clothes had been stolen. She requested the court make her estranged husband return her clothes and demanded that the court force him to financially support her. Black women would have been conscious of the Bureau's efforts to curb dependency. Therefore, they understood that the organization would take cases of abandonment seriously. In Wallop's case, the court looked for Dennis, her husband, but they were unable to find him. In cases where abandoned women were unaware of their husband's location, they asked the court to reach out to other courts and force their partners to return or send the money. Anna Marie Brown was aware her husband, James Brown, was in Maryland and doing well in the way of work. She complained he would not send his wages back to support her and asked the court to help her. And so this introduction into the Freedmen's Bureau on Single Black Women got my wheels just, it set my mind on fire because now I'm thinking, okay, single Black women are like Polly Jennings, they're out there they are having a rough time, but they are trying to rectify or resolve the issues in their life using an agency that is kind of dealing in this, <laughs> in this, in this realm, but is not really supposed to deal in this realm, as you all, or as I should say, the Freedmen's Bureau was um, organized to mainly help transition enslaved African Americans to to the community or to freedom. Um, it came, they helped in a number of ways and historians have four years uh, discussed if it was successful or unsuccessful. They set up schools and did all of this work. But I don't think that the Freedmen's Bureau acknowledged that they were supposed to be helping black women with divorces and abandonment. Yet black women kept, and I mean, these are just you can easily, this, I focused on Virginia um, because I just so happen to be closest to Virginia. I lived in the DMV, but you can open any Freedmen's Bureau records and see cases of Black women asking the Freedmen's Bureau for help, asking them to either locate partners, help them separate for partners, help them um, in, in, in other interesting cases, get their children back from partners who have taken their children and are using the child's labor all of these things just, it, it really took my breath away because I never heard of Black women using a state agent or a federal agency like this, right? Um, and so that, there are also conversations happening and Mary Farmer Kaiser's book talks about this. The Freedmen's Bureau is really, really interested in stopping dependency. That is one of the things that they're just hell bent on. If black people are free, if black Americans are free and they are no longer enslaved, they have to work. There's no excuse for them not to work. Um, and whatever help that we offer, whatever rations we all offer should have a limit. One of the things you find in the Freedmen's Bureau records is though Oliver Otis Howard is talking about this. Stop the dependency, stop the rations. You can't do this, this looks bad. We have to make them work. They need to learn to depend on themselves. And people like uh, Freedmen's Bureau agent, I think supervisor Orlando Brown in Virginia, he's saying, okay, Oliver Otis, that, that can't work. 
You cannot stock rations. You cannot do these things because there are people who need these things and without them, they will die. They will, it, it will be, a, it's a life or death situation. So the rations that the Freedmen's Bureau is supply, are supplying are necessary. Um, and so one of the first things that, so, and, and I should stop, Orlando Brown also says that there's a specific population of people who need these rations more than anybody else, and they are Black women. That again stops me in my tracks because by Black women appealing to the Freedmen's Bureau, they are telling the Freedmen's Bureau, forget your policy, forget what you think works. What we need is help, and we're not going to stop coming to your office until we get that help. Again, pulling in a federal agency that is supposed to help in the transition from slavery to freedom and local affairs. And I thought to myself, and this is such a um, a contemporary conversation, right? I um I I grew up late late nineties, early you know, and I remember hearing conversations about welfare and black women and um and what black women forced the state to do and how all of them have food stamps and all. And so I thought to myself, this is a conversation that started in 1865. Like I, I thought this conversation started in the 80s, yeah. <laughs> in the late 70s, early 80s. But who knew that in during the Civil War, people are discussing dependency welfare and it centers around Black women, right? Um, another group of women that I talk about in my research Again, I knew about that. I did not know about them before going forward, but now it's information everywhere. I talk about United States Colored Troops Widows. I told you all that I grew up surrounded by the Civil War, and so probably uninformed about what it represented. My mother showed me Gone with the Wind, and so the idea I had of a Civil War widow was scarlet. I knew about white widows during the Civil War. I had, there are plenty of books written about them, but it never dawned on me what women, uh, wives of United States colored troops did or what widows, uh, African-American widows did. And so I began uh, today, and there was so much, when I started this research, I knew about Brandy Brimmer's work. Um, she's a, a, a scholar who focuses on United States colored troop widows. Donald Schaefer's work, he's a scholar who focuses on vet, um, pension files, which I will discuss. But th those works were coming out, but there was no full book about African-American widows. And so I started this work because as you all know, um, or as you all can imagine that these women were considered single, a different class of single, but nonetheless still single. In 1867, Samuel C. Armstrong, a Freedmen's Bureau superintendent, updated his superior on the conditions of free men and women in his district. His letter described a large, destitute, helpless class who remained unable to immigrate. He went on to reveal that many of these were soldiers' wives and children, now widows who were struggling to even live. In Virginia, nearly 5,000 African-American men enlisted to fight for the Union. The union, units were comprised of formerly enslaved and free Black males. Union records reveal many of the units were created near contraband camps or communities with large population of free Black men and women. Three regiments were organized, three USCT regiments were organized in Norfolk, Virginia. This makes North, this made Norfolk, Virginia a rich source for studying Black women's interaction with the pension system. Again, I wanted to understand what a community of African-American widows looked like. Did they create expectations for each other? Each other? How did they help each other navigate the pension system? Um, and I was able to understand a bit more after finding the pension files of Three women, Marianne Langston, Lavinia Ashburn, and Frances Nuts, over a period of nearly 20 years, these women supported each other by testifying each other's pension applications, um, and together they worked to navigate the daunting pension system and also acquire economic means. And so from this, these three women um, and several other widows in Norfolk, Virginia, I was able to finally answer some questions like, Okay, um, they 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 definitely set standards for each other. In one case, um, not Francis Nuts, but another widow. Um, she, so the, I could go. This could be a whole other talk about the pension system. The pension system is one of the most 
oh, I know we talk about taxes today, all of the, all of these systems today that we think make no sense, but the United States pension system after the Civil War is the worst, most convoluted, most complicated system ever. And it goes through many changes and all of these things. And what um, what I find interesting is that Black women keep navigating, all widows keep navigating this system, but Black widows have a special set of circumstances that they encounter. One of, one of the things they encounter is that the uh, pension bureau agents, they don't understand that marriage is very confusing for them because we know um, formerly enslaved African-Americans did not have marriage certificates. They had different meanings for marriage. And so the pension bureau agents are like, hold up, wait. How in the world are you saying you all are married? You have no birth certificate. How are you supposed to prove those kids are yours? There's no baptism record that like, it, it was just a whole bunch of things, right? And eventually the, the pension system morphs to accommodate these things, but bureau agents are still very, very, um, what should I say, specific with black women about what constitutes a marriage. If you are not married to a, a, um, um, a veteran or a um, USCT soldier, you could, and you say that you are, you face legal ramifications for this. And so in many of the pension files, there are women just testifying to each other. I know in the case of Marianne Langston, Francis Nutt steps in and says, I know Marianne Langston was married to Isaiah because we lived together in freedom. I remember Isaiah coming and stopping by. I saw them, they were loving, they had children. And this helps Marianne Langston secure a pension. But these in these testimonies, you also get things about, they talk about what widowhood means. And in one of the cases, um, a woman says, well, she wasn't exactly married to her husband. She didn't act like it. And once he passed, we told her that it was not proper to go outside. And so they are then, we have always heard about how white women mourned, how white widows mourned, right? They wore black, they, that what it looked like, but there I was able to discern that there may have been some communal expectations about mourning in the black community, especially in the widowhood community. Um, and so that, that, it just got me in, and really you all, you can, I don't, I suggest you all, you may have other things to do with your time, but if you don't, I said, <laughs> please go and find any Civil War pension file. I find them to be the most interesting. They can range in pages. They could be five pages to 200 pages, but it, it is really women, um, especially the widow, widow pensions, describing um, life, describing what life is like. Um, people testify to how they got to the Union Army, what war looked like, and, and so many instances um, I found a description of the Battle of the Crater and a woman described it. She said, you know, there were body parts flying everywhere. I'll never forget that. And so it is It is a really clear description of the Civil War from those that were around it. Now I will briefly talk about, I know I'm running over time, I'll briefly talk about my time as a Virginia Humanities Fellow. Um, during the time of my research last summer, I was able to close crucial gaps in my research. And my time at the Library of Virginia was inv invaluable. Perhaps the most, the biggest and most pressing research question I answered is what happened to Polly Jennings? Now, listen, you all, I had dropped the Polly Jennings story and wrote my entire dissertation, but I knew for a fact at the Library of Virginia, <laughs> they had the state penitentiary records. And so I knew that Polly Jennings was in the state penitentiary records. And so when I received the fellowship, the first thing on my mind was, look, I'm going to find Polly. This is it. I've, I've, this is the moment I've been waiting for. And this really seriously took like seven years, much longer because I received the Virginia Humanities Fellowship right before COVID-19, <laughs> right before COVID-19. COVID-19 happened and I had to wait. And I, John can correct me about two, two years to actually get in the Library of Virginia. But this whole time, Polly Jennings was there on my mind. Because I knew she was in the state penitentiary records, I started there, but I could not find her. Um, this is because I found out last summer that Jennings had been pardoned in 1877 by Governor James Kempner. I was able to find the testimony of community members who wrote to Kempner 
and um, for the pardon. And they believed that Jennings should be pardoned because she had shown exemplary behavior and they were concerned about her children who lived in the community. Jennings served nine years in the state penitentiary before she was released. I, I am still unable to find out if she was ever reunited with her children and what her life looked, at, look, looked like after her release, but the, re the new research added a layer to my story. Why did the community members rally around Jennings nine years later? Where were her children and what community did she return to? And so I believe that this story would be easily resolved, but when I found this part, in, it blew me away. Um, and to the, I, I really cannot tell you all why Jennings is such a focus in Halifax County. I don't, uh, the only thing that I can possibly think of is that her story sticks around for so much, so long in the community because her children are still there, but she's eventually pardoned and only serves nine years in jail. Another critical research question I wanted to answer was where did, um, where else could African-American single black women go after be, beyond the Freedmen's Bureau. Um, we know that the Freedmen's Bureau was supposed to be an unbiased agency that was supposed to support formerly enslaved black people from slavery to freedom. But where else, if that was the only place for single black women to go, that, that was, was that just it? Were there any local agencies around? What about county agencies? And so I was able, I started looking in overseer of the poor records and I was able to locate, um, women in counties who the overseer of the poor minutes described um, Black women coming to the office. And so in one instance, um, one of the overseer of the poor minutes in 1870 say it was packed with applicants for aid, most of them being able-bodied colored women who professed to be having to being unable to attain employment, employment, many of them being mothers, all of them objecting to having their children in the charge of the overseer of the poor and provided with homes. This let me know that black women not only appealed to the Freedmen's Bureau for work, but they also appealed to the county for help. And that similar to the Freedmen's Bureau appeals, they wanted to keep their children. One of the things that in the Freedmen's Bureau you see is that I'm not going to apprentice out my child um, for money. I don't wanna do that. I, I know that that's an option. And you see that in the overseer of the poor records as well. My um, Virginia Humanities Fellowship greatly advanced my research. As you can tell, I seriously resolved <laughs> critical questions in my research. And it quite honestly gave me the time to dig deep into my passion without the interruption of student emails and faculty responsibilities. It was one, and I should also, it was one of the first times that I, after my dissertation, again, I, I, I finished, um, I finished, I graduated in 2020 in the middle of the pandemic. And so it was one of the first times since the pandemic that I was, I could actually, actually dedicate to the microfilm machines that I love, to talking about my research in a way that I was not able to do before. John and the rest of the Library of Virginia staff just had invaluable knowledge that helped me advance this project. And so for that, I am forever grateful for the fellowship and my time at the Library of Virginia. With that, I will wrap up my presentation and open up the floor for questions. Thank you so much, Arlisha. That was uh, that was fantastic. Scholars such as yourself are the reason why we love doing this fellowship program with Virginia Humanities and able to do a deep dive. And you alluded to the pandemic. You you persevered through those couple of years where we. We couldn't have anybody uh, yeah. on the premises for a stretch. Your topic is just, it's extraordinary uh, in, in my mind. Uh, and that few people, if anybody has, have looked into this before. And the things that we talked about while you were here and that you alluded to in terms of the status of single uh, African-American women left with, you know, children because an African-American man, they, they could not find them. They were sold down south, or, or they had a different wife by this time. It's just fascinating. Um, and I want to highlight, just while it's fresh in my mind, my colleague Roger Christman has been putting in the chat links to our penitentiary records, which you mm -hmm. mentioned, the finding aid, and also to our clemency records, public accounts of the over overseers of the poor. He's one of our, our state records archivists that uh, uh, knows all. 
this is quite extraordinary. And how many times for those of us in this world or anybody who does research, one story such as Polly Jennings gets us started on a path of discovery. Yes. So we've got some great questions already in the chat. So um, why do you think Black women utilize the Freedmen's Bureau instead of the local court system for solutions to their problems? That's a good question. I I mean, of of course, I don't have anything in writing that says um, why they preferred one over the other. But what we do know is because of Mary Farmer Kaiser's work on dependency and, and, uh, and welfare in the Freedmen's Bureau, Black women who were single were actually more likely to stay on rations and receive aid than other parties, let it be a black man or a family. The, again, the agents on the ground, Orlando Brown, understood that black women, especially single black women, they didn't have that many options. We heard the story of Polly Jennings. Um, I also see on the local court, on the local agencies like the overseer of the poor, they may have faced some sort of biased or prejudiced approach, right? The Freedmen's Bureau is supposed to act unbiased, but they have, nobody has any control over the local court agency or or over the local agency like the overseer of the poor. One of the things I also discuss in my dissertation are divorce records and divorce records move from the Freedmen's Bureau court to the local court. Um, And that was one of the first things I, I tried to find in the Library of Virginia, just Okay, in the in the in the mix between free, when the Freedmen's Bureau is in office or in power, black women again besiege the offices. Please help me separate from my husband. And the pure Freedmen's Bureau helps them do this. They are one of the first, and this is kind of mind-boggling. The first federal agency they determine alimony, they determine child support, they do all of this like groundbreaking work. When it goes to the local court though, black women may, may have not besieged the offices in that way. And one of the um, one of the stats that I know I was able to find is that the instances where black women were granted divorces in the local court, most likely centered around an accusation of domestic violence. And so it's just one agency or one federal agency may have been easier than the local agency. That does not mean, though, that they did not try to play both parties, right? <laughs> both routes, which, you know, guaranteed some level of success or did not. But um, the overseer of the poor records exist in 1870. And John, I think the date is when the Freedmen's Bureau moves out of Virginia in 1872, about that time, yeah. Okay. So the free the overseer of the poor records exist in 1870. So there is a chance that a woman was going to the Freedmen's Bureau, but also going to the overseer of the poor at the same time. And just you know, wherever the eggs may fall, wherever everything may land, that's how she is, you know, re- re- awarded her her uh, compensation. So that it, it brings me to a question I was wondering about. Uh, I can I can guess that. Uh, African-American women and African-Americans in general would certainly have find pushback from local authorities and local entities. Um, Was there pushback or at least maybe ambivalence on the part of the Freedmen's Bureau in helping African-American women uh, who, as you say, are sort of don't fit into some of their preconceived notions Mm -hmm. of what African-Americans needed after the uh, after freedom came? So the Freemans, I mean, John, it's just the Freemans Bureau is a mess. I mean, it really is a great, great idea, uh, theoretically, but having, and I should also say this, the Freemans Bureau, like most government agencies in the 19th century, are mostly ran by white males. Freemans Bureau is a special case because most of the Freemans Bureau agents who work in Virginia are from the North. And so right. They have a completely different perspective of what white Virginians need require and what black Virginians need um, and require. And that when I when I'm talking about reconstruction with my students, I always tell them like, listen, this time in American history is extremely complicated, but it is also very, um, I, I don't know, it's just a very explosive time. And so Freedmen's Bureau agents are, when they reach Virginia, they are shocked at the violence that they see. They continuously write Oliver Otis Howard and say like, I don't think this can be fixed. 
<laughs> you know, I don't think this can be fixed with the civil, it, like the racial turmoil here is just beyond anything that I've imagined. And the same thing happens with the dependency issue. Oliver Otis Howard says, stop the aid, stop the rations. And there's in, in Virginia, they're like, I don't think you can do that. I just really don't think that works. Um, Howard. And so it, in some cases, um, I never felt, well, that's not true. Sometimes I found ambivalence, but in many of the local or domestic disputes, Freedmen's Bureau agents were unwilling to move. Um, they had a real, they had a real, so for instance, transportation or migration. Um, there is a time when black, when black people in Virginia are moving around trying to find out where family members meant, possibly moving from Richmond to Alexandria, all of these things in the Freedmen's Bureau, looking for children, doing all of these things. And their transportation policies are extremely restrictive. Many times they do not want people to leave because as you all, as I said before, the Freedmen's Bureau is interested in the transition from slavery to freedom, working on a free labor society. In order for a free labor society to exist, somebody has to stay and work. You cannot all go <laughs> to Washington, D.C. You cannot all go to Richmond, Virginia. And so they talk about um, people not, not, not moving forward to their sort of freedom, to their manifestation of freedom. In one case, there is um, they also talk about moving people involuntarily. So in some cases where they're Craney Island, for example, Craney Island is a large um, it's, it really becomes a place for all destitute people. And uh, Freemans Bureau agents talk about people just coming in and not working and doing whatever. And he, one of them suggests moving people from Craney Island somewhere else involuntarily. So, you know, and that, that, that beckons me to think like how much different is this than slavery if you're talking about moving families of people without their permission. Um, right. There is always a conflict between the Freedmen's Bureau's idea of freedom and what freedom actually means for African-Americans, especially single Black women. What, you know, what, it, it's always going to be a conflict. And I, I, I find that. So ambivalence, conflict, conflicts, just mi just miscommunications, all, all sorts of things. <laughs> well, and that just adds to, you know, adds more to what African-American women especially are, mm -hmm. are dealing with. Um, let's see, here's some more questions. Um, let's see. Um, did you find any women from Alexandria City or County in your research? Oh, yes. So um, there is a scholar, Joseph P. Reedy. He has a great, he did a lot of great work on Alexandria, um, Alexandria after, during the Civil War and after. And so Alexandria is really, and I mean, Again, today, when I say these words, we know what they mean. The government really experiments with almost public housing in Alexandria, specifically for single Black women. Um, there, is, there is housing created. It is not good. I should say that. All right. It is not good. It's a cesspool of disease and all of these other things. But this one community in Alexandria is specifically for women who have been abandoned or widowed women of, of the Civil War, and they live in Alexandria. And so it's a big, it's a big, um, it's a big part of my early chapters of my, or my early, yeah, the first couple of chapters of my research, because I talk about the Union Army and, and single Black women. Okay, great. Um, let's see, uh, why do you think single Black women historically, and also currently, represent a nexus of concerns about dependency and the state? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a combination of race and gender. Um, I, again, did not believe that welfare and all of this talk went back into the 1860s. And so it is interesting to, to see why, why Black women become this sort of, 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 concern for um, the Union Army, the Freedmen's Bureau, and later I should point out the internal Black community. Um, my research doesn't end in um, after Reconstruct, it doesn't end during Reconstruction. 
um, after the Freedmen's Bureau leaves, Black Virginians are seriously concerned about single Black women. They do not understand why these women are having babies out of wedlock, um, why they are showing up different, different places. There is a, and me and John talked about this while I was researching, um, there are all of these calls in newspapers about send your girls here, send women here who are unmarried to certain places um, in in the early 20th century, you see thing, uh, the African American, the Black community um, talking about do not send single Black women to the cities. They're not smart enough to survive. They'll be robbed, keep them at home until they're married. And so, um, I, of course, I spent a lot of student loan debt and time on this. I believe <laughs> that they, single Black women really determine what the federal government. Um, policy is about welfare um, to their detriment. They force the federal government to answer their appeals. Sometimes they are telling the state what what is it, what uh, what alimony is, what child support is. Um, really defining this structure that we know hinders them in the late eighties and nineties. Right? They then become the welfare queens. Um, and I, I I think more to that question is that you're after after the Civil War, Virginia is messed up. So there are not just single Black women who need this help. White women need this help. White men, everyone needs help. Everyone needs help. This is not a situation where this small population of people are, are destitute. Um, that's one of the things the Freedmen's Bureau agent says. Look, it is not just Black people who are messed up. This war destroyed this state. And so I don't, I don't know. I don't know. It, it becomes, it, well, I do know that we know the local agencies cover white women after um, Reconstruction, right? We know that the overseer of the poor, they do grant help to white women. There are all sorts of homes opened up for white women. Um, and what I mean by that, like orphanage homes, all, all of these places, uh, poor houses, what we call that, we don't call use that term today, but poor houses are opened up for white women, but black women are sometimes left out of those things, especially if the community does not have one. And so where black women are left to go to the state earlier in the 20th century, white women do not have to go to state agencies. And so that that may have been the case, but I, to this day, um, I, I, I just think it's a combo of race and gender that that makes them the the central portion of these of these arguments on welfare and dependency. So a question about uh, Polly Jennings: Have you been able to track down any of her descendants to see if they were told anything about her? I have not. I have not. I have not. And again, I'm not even sure she returned to the community that um, she that that helped. Part, get her, get her um, pardoned. So I'm not, I was, ne I'm, I've never been able to find them beyond, find her beyond that. But that would be, I'm pretty sure they're still there. So it, it's a very interesting story. Right, definitely. Um, uh, here's another, the idea of a black mother killing her baby because of desperate circumstances was also in Toni Morrison's beloved. Mm -hmm. Do you see evidence that this happened in more situations? I did not find other situations in freedom, but um, during enslavement, uh, we know we know the story of Margaret Garner, um, a, a, an important book called Driven by Madness by Dr. Nikki Taylor talks about Margaret Garner in the case of her um, in, her killing her child um, because she did not want them to return to slavery. We know those cases of enslavement, but I never found another case in freedom, which is also why this case of Polly Jennings was so, was so fast and not fascinating is the wrong word, but it, it just really gripped me. I, I, I didn't, I couldn't understand why this could happen or, or what sort of, and you know, and, and again, as even as a historian, I, I often think about the sort of destitution you have to be facing to think about murder, right? Um, and, and that just points to how how Virginia looked after the Civil War. It did not look um, like a, a, a place being rebuilt. It must have been some sort of destitution that everyone was facing. Uh, so here's a more of a, a research question. Uh, uh, talking about you began and ended uh, your discussion about Polly Jennings. And the question is, uh, Arlish, can Dr. Norwood, can you speak to the relationship between the individual story such as Polly Jennings and the larger history uh, you are writing? 
So Polly Jennings again represents the uh, Polly Jennings represents the the far reaching side of research on single black women. Um, um, research about single women, unmarried women, abandoned women, divorced women, um, widowed women. I just want to understand more about their lives. And Paula Jennings was my first sort of introduction to that. And so here's one, um, thanking you for the talk. And she says, uh, so this person says, I'm interested in researching the lives of African-American women a few decades later in the 19 teens and 1920s where would you suggest that this person starts? I would start with um, not, well, kind of the club women's movement, but a little bit later. So I would start with um, that sort of work, the club women's movement work, any church, church, um, church organizations or church records work. That's one of the things that I pick up in my research in, in the later half of the 19th century, because uh, the black church again is becomes instrumental in the black community. And really they, um, they, they cover or discuss black women in Lynn too. They want to know under single black women in Lynn. They want to know where what they're doing. Are you trying to get married again? Why are you? Why do you keep having kids out of wedlock? And so, any information or any scholarship on the black church would be good. Any scholarship on black women's organizations would be great for 1910s and 1920s. Um, after. Well, really, 1890 to 1900s, we're talking about the nadir of race relations, so we see a different sort of racial violence, right? Anything about lynching and Black women would be would be good. Um, but yeah, those those are some places I would start the Black church, Black women's organizations. Um, if you're talking about, there, there are so many good books about urban um, because of course, 1910s and 1920s, we started to talk about the Great Migration, African Americans moving from the South to the North, and so there are tons of books about the Great Migration. I'm thinking about a book, um, I can't think of it, but it's about uh, children, uh, young girls, young girls in the orphans' court in New York City. That is good, and so anything around those things, the church, black organizations. If you're talking about urban populations, look for orphanages or the or the court system. So we've got a couple of questions related to, to more uh, localities. So have you found any information uh, from, let's say, like Mecklenburg or Halifax County in the south side, or perhaps Westmoreland, Lancaster County? Where, where's, the where's the geography uh, uh, in terms of your project? So Polly Jennings is actually Halifax County. Okay. Yeah, Polly Jennings is Halifax County. Mecklenburg. So when the, I should say first that when the, when the Freedmen's Bureau was in operation, there were districts, not necessarily counties. There were several counties in those districts. And so, of course, I know districts, but I may not know the counties. I'm trying to think Lancaster. Mecklenburg. I can't think off the top of my head, but I know for sure Polly Jennings is in Halifax County. And then uh, another about Westmoreland or Lancaster County. And they're asking about surnames of McKinney or Crab. No, I never came across any surnames. So the question asks, where can we read your work? Uh, where has it been published or where is your uh, where are you going to be published? Oh, I am going to be published somewhere nice, hopefully. I don't, I don't have a contract yet, but um, my work is I have two articles coming out. One is in a, a book about Black women in Reconstruction, well, Civil War and Reconstruction. And I have another article, a chapter, I'm sorry, chapter coming out about divorce records and Black women. That's fantastic. And I have no doubt that you'll get a book contract on, your, on the manuscript that you were describing. Thank yes. you so much, Alicia, on behalf of the Library and Humanities. And thanks to all of you for being with us for this virtual talk. And hopefully we'll see y'all down the road for more virtual talks and in-person talks. You too. Thank you all.